So we've considered one of the uh, important influential versions of the teleological argument, the design argument from William Paley from the 1700s. That was the argument by analogy, so that Paley argued that God is the universe, what a watchmaker is to a watch. A recent uh, influential version that withstands another the objection, a number of the objections that people have made to Paley, Swinburne's argument. Uh, Richard Swinburne's a famous Oxford philosopher and he's got several books that have been widely read and are widely respected, Faith and Reason, The Existence of God, The Resurrection of God Incarnate, and he gives us a much more sophisticated uh, version of the argument and one that uh, you'll be surprised to see how compatible it is with the results of uh, modern science. Okay, so let's ask this question on behalf of Swinburne. What needs to be explained about the universe? For Paley, of course, the prime example of some object that needed to be explained was the eye. Swinburne's going to go simultaneously bigger and smaller. So Swinburne's interested in some, let's make some philosophical distinctions. Uh, first, there's matter in the universe rather than nothing. One might expect there to be a void, but we've got stuff instead of nothing. And <clears throat> furthermore, most important, perhaps most importantly, is that that matter behaves according to a set of formulable, relatively simple natural laws. So we've got matter and we've got matter the natural law. So we can tease out some more specifics here about what exactly Swinburne finds surprising and what's in need of explanation. You're now familiar with this distinction between temporal regularities and regularities of success, uh, coexistence, what we mean is lawful regularities, that there are not just that matter is organized or has certain specific features now, but that it has it now and now and now and continues to be that way. So carbon, for instance, has had the same sort of behavior since the Big Bang. So for 13.7 billion years, carbon has done what it does. We'll talk about that some more in details in a few minutes. Uh, Swinburne's also struck by the fact that there are re relatively few rules describing these regularities. There are only a few laws of nature, and we'll see more about this from physicists in a moment, but um, Swinburne's struck by the fact that the secrets of nature are uh, revealable. They're, they're penetrable by the human mind, and that's no accident he's, as he sees it. God structured the way, uh, God structured the world in such a way to have that kind of simple uh, graspable uh, set of uh, structures and features in it. But we'll get to that conclusion soon enough. So there's temporal regularities, there's laws, there's few laws, simple laws. The objects in the world um, are composed of few, not many, simple parts. So uh, these days uh, physicists and chemists uh, quantum physicists talk about something called the standard model which posits the existence of 12 or so basic uh, subatomic particles that make up that are the constituent uh, building blocks of reality so quarks and muons mesons neutrinos and they all have anti counterparts and these are the things out of which we ultimately get carbon hydrogen uranium and all the other elements on the periodic table that you know from your chemistry class uh, Swinburne also calls our attention to this fact there's no intermediate or in-between kinds of particles between these simple building blocks. The stuff in the world isn't messy, mixed, or overly complicated. There are discrete, distinct, <coughs> excuse me, classes, uh, categories, uh, types of matter, and types of parts, and there's no blurring or blending or um, hybrid sorts of uh, bits in between. Uh, the, the matter has particular flavors, if you will, could, particular categories are, that it fits into. Uh, furthermore, all of the simple particles throughout the universe have the same fundamental characteristics, and Swinburne's just helping himself here to the same thing that modern physicists and chemists would all assert. They maintain that across the universe, not just in the part, the tiny corner of the universe that we can observe right in front of us, but across the universe, matter, hydrogen, for instance, is the same everywhere, um, in all places, at all times. And uh, 
the fact that all of this orderliness, this simplicity, this elegance persists throughout time. So for billions of years, matter in the universe has conformed to these regularities. All of that strikes Swinburne as desperately in need of explanation. We wouldn't expect that to happen on its own. That uh, demands some form of explanation. We can't be satisfied with that. That's just being a brute fact of nature. There's got to be some account came from. Okay, so there's lots of more modern, uh, complicated examples, but just to get to just to have some uh, simple uh, examples in mind, Swinburne's got in mind uh, principles like the Newtonian laws of mechanics. You'll be familiar with some of these. Every object in a state of uniform motion tends to remain in that state of motion unless an external force is applied to it. The relationship between an object's mass m, its acceleration a, and the applied force f is f equals m a. Uh, and, and if that's not a simple, uh, calculable, elegant sort of formula that, that, that sort of points to the core features of the universe, I don't know what is. Swinburne definitely put his finger on something here. That it's remarkable that we would find such a elegant, simple rule that governs the basic relationships of matter um, in the universe. Furthermore, uh, Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, or more famously Newton's uh, universal law of gravitation, uh, where several of these um, variables are, or several of these letters represent constants, and this gives us an equation that explains the force. Now, the fact that this is a universal law of gravitation is important. Uh, Newton is cited for uh, having recognized that this this formula will tell us that were you with the mass of your body, the two m's on the top of the equation represent two masses. So were you on the uh, surface of the moon, and the moon has a mass, and you has a you have a mass, were we to plug in the distances and the uh, the other values into this equation, we could calculate that you roughly would weigh one sixth the amount, um, or gravity would exert ex itself uh, one sixth as much on your body as it would on the surface of the Earth, or if you were on Jupiter you would have nine times the amount of gravity exerting on your, on your mass. So it's a universal law. It applies to the moon, to Jupiter, to Earth, across the board. Okay, now that's exactly the sort of, uh, uh, of universal, uh, broad, uh, um, physical law that Swinburne's got in mind that, that he says needs to be explained. Uh, the other, another good example, just to have some cases in mind here, uh, consider the periodic table of elements. Uh, the, the level of consistent structure here is just remarkable. All atoms have uh, electron shells. The first shell holds two. The second um, shell holds six electrons. The third holds ten electrons. Elements in the table are grouped by families for similar characteristics. Then when a shell is filled with more and more electrons, um, they must jump out to the next shell. The chemical properties change dramatically when this happens, from gas to solid at room temperature, from stable to unstable, and so on. Big changes in chemical properties are shown with a new row on the table. Elements are grouped according to gas, liquid, or solid states. And when you sort of really appreciate what's going on here with the periodic table of elements, you can't help but be struck by the the structure and the way that the physical reality that we observe, the one that makes our bodies possible, that makes everything possible um, in the universe, is because of that deep structure. Because atoms have those basic features, and they all have those features, and that dictates what kinds of interactions they will have and how they will behave. Okay, all of that, says Swinburne, needs to be explained. Now, a natural question to ask here would be to say, a natural response would be to say, isn't it science's job to explain the laws of nature? I mean, Swinburne's making these demands and says, well, look, all this stuff needs to be explained, but isn't that exactly what science does? It tells us what's, uh, why there are these laws of nature. Well, Swinburne says no, not in answer to that question. What science does is it discovers and describes these regularities. So science observes them, it finds them, it identifies them. And those regularities make it possible to do science. And furthermore, science explains low levels and low level laws in terms of higher level laws, so they do draw out connections between laws. But science itself doesn't tell us why there's laws. 
In order for us to conduct a scientific investigation into the world, there must be matter with uniform, predictable behavior that submits to our inquiries. You can't conduct science unless there's natural laws. So science itself can't answer the question, why are there natural laws? Science only makes sense within the context of natural law. Science can only operate presuming natural law. Uh, but the deeper question of why there's natural laws is outside of the framework of what science can do. Theories and predictions, the kinds that science do, um, are impossible unless there's something constant out there to formulate a theory about that has, a pre that has some kind of predictable behavior. Uh, the question, why are there laws of nature, is beyond the framework of science. It tells us what they are, but it doesn't tell us why there are some or why there's something rather than nothing. So Swinburne thinks that we're really past the ceiling um, beyond which science can't, uh, can't give any more answers. And you know, there's several places here where we ought to bring up Paley again, but notice the difference here between the way Swinburne's coming at this question and the way Paley did. Paley uh, not having some of these modern scientific explanations of things like eyes um, or human organic systems in hand and not being able to imagine how they could be explained says oh well it must be that God did it. But Swinburne's not going to do that. Swinburne is leaving room here for science. Swinburne has carved out all of the space that science needs to do its work and then he says having a world that is that submits to scientific inquiry uh, is uh, is itself a remarkable fact and it's one that indicates design, it indicates purpose, it indicates that there's some sort of consciousness, all of it at work. All right, so we can bring out some of those details. Science doesn't explain why there are laws. So Swinburne thinks there are several things that demand an explanation that are beyond the range of science. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are there law-like regularities rather than no law-like regularities, just, just irregularity, just chaos? Why are there these laws rather than some other set? Because some other particular laws could have happened for all we know. Or maybe more to the point, why are there laws that are conducive to human existence when so many others are possible? Now, I need to make a distinction here because there's a number of modern teleological arguments that I'm going to call fine-tuning arguments. And they will really make this uh, point in D from, on Swinburne's behalf. They will make that point much more forcefully and they will build the whole argument around this, around this question. They will say, well, look, um, physics, the physics we find in the world appears to be finely tuned to a narrow range of variations, a narrow range of laws that make it possible for complex life like us to exist. And if you change those variables at all, even the slightest, everything falls apart. You might get a regular world, but you can't get a world that is conducive to life or to human existence. Okay, that's another family, another variety of teleological argument, but it's not exactly the one that Swinburne's given here. Swinburne's giving more an argument um, on behalf of physics itself. Not so much about the um, conduciveness of physics to human existence, um, or sometimes the term that gets used here is that the universe is biophilic. It is, uh, it is nature, it is uh, a life favoring. It's, uh, it loves life, or that the universe, uh, the periodic table of elements, the physical laws we find, uh, permit or allow. Okay, so all of that needs to be explained, says Swinburne, and. Well, we might be tempted, this can't be the answer. It can't be that the world would just accidentally fall into this organized, uh, structured sets of behaviors. It can't just be that all hydrogen, all throughout the entire universe, uh, by accident, happen to be all have uh, just the particular atomic properties it does. That makes no sense. Swinburne thinks that we would not expect any of these to occur by random chance. The odds are astronomically small that things would just line up the way they do on the periodic table or that the periodic table would be the same here as it is everywhere else. So he thinks that's that, 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 the, that the sort of other live hypothesis we might consider here is randomness and that's just too preposterous to be considered. Now we're going to come back to this point in the objection shortly. Um, okay, so we've established so far, uh, or at least Swinburne thinks he's established at this stage, that science can't answer the big questions that we need answered. Why is there something rather than nothing and so on. And we've also seen that these laws uh, describe or capture what nature is. 
So that means that there can't be a natural explanation of those because those are nature. We're sort of asking, well, why is there a nature? Why is there a physics that uh, behaves um, and some other option? OK, so if the explanation can't be natural, then the obvious move, the obvious inference here is to say it must be supernatural. It must be from beyond the natural world. So taking supernatural here to just mean quite literally what it says. OK, so Swinburne says the only explanation is supernatural or beyond the natural realm. And furthermore, the regularities we've been considering, so there's something rather than nothing, there's few laws, there's simple laws, they're accessible to the human mind, um, there's no in-between parts, the, the laws are pervasive throughout the universe, that all suggests great purpose, design, intelligence, intent, and vast power. What, what sort of being short of an all-powerful being could, through its act, through its exercise of its power, could create an entire universe with a uh, with the periodic table of elements or with all of the physical laws doing what they do surely to create everything one would have to have all power for instance in order to conceive of uh, of everything and conceive of the vastness of the universe one would have to have all knowledge so swinburne thinks that we could we should read God's properties, the divine properties, intelligence, uh, power, and goodness, and the like, off of nature, off of physics itself. Furthermore, the beauty of creation also suggests profound love. And Swinburne, you know, makes the uh, makes the analogy to humans and their acts of creation. How when they create order, some of that striving is towards a an appreciation of beauty. And Swinburne says that we can see in the beauty of creation that there must be great love behind it. So Swinburne suggests then we can get the uh, moral perfection or omnibenevolence or this other property, this other divine property. Okay, so that means then that there must be a creator or a designer with infinite power and knowledge who's responsible for the complexity, law-likeness, and habitability of the universe. Okay, so now a few more words. Notice the improvement over Paley's argument. Darwin's theory of natural selection gave us a better explanation of the appearance of design in organism, organisms than Paley's explanation. So Paley, uh, you know, uh, runs up against uh, biology directly. Paley, uh, unless he's going to just flatly deny biology, which some you know modern uh, design arguments advocates do, uh, Swinburne's not doing that, by the way. But unless Paley wants to just flatly deny biology, biology gives us a better explanation of why we find adaptive uh, features in organisms. So Paley gets trumped by the theory of natural selection. But notice that Swinburne doesn't face this problem. Swinburne doesn't need to deny evolution. Swinburne can embrace evolution. Evolution is a scientific theory about how life developed within the context of natural law. And Swinburne's going deeper. He's going more fundamental. He wants to say, he's saying, why is there natural law? Why is there natural law that makes evolution possible, for instance? So he's not raising doubts about evolution. He did not do that. Swinburne is pointing to a level of order that is more fundamental, a level of structure in the world that is precedent evolution. Okay, so now let's consider some objections. Uh, turns out physicists do have something to say about some of the speculations that, pay, that Swinburne's making here. Modern cosmologists, astronomers, and physicists have begun to consider theories and explanations that can address Swinburne's questions. They are thinking about why is there something rather than nothing? Why does it have just these laws instead of some other laws? Why not some other set? Why are there no in-between parts and the like? And we're actually in a golden age of uh, cosmology where uh, some remarkable theories are being uh, put forward and then in some cases interestingly even tested to try to see for their try to check for their scientific validity. Lee Smolin, Max Tegmark, uh, Lumine and others have suggested that our universe is in fact one of infinitely many universes all with different sets of natural laws different configurations of matter even no matter at all there are nothing universes out there these universes inhabit, inhabit a larger multiverse, which is the broader term for of containment that holds all of these other universes. Okay, so here's a few more details about the multiverse from Max Tegmark. Um, 
So in physical review a few years back, uh, we get this uh, this sort of titillating suggestion from Tegmark. Um, he says, although we do not n do not yet know what the theory would look like, particle particle physics and cosmology have reached a point where all measurements ever made can be explained, at least in principle, with equations that fit on a few pages and involve merely 32 unexplained numerical constants. So the correct theory of everything could even turn out to be simple enough to describe with equations that fit on a t-shirt. Now notice so far what, what Tegmark has said is consistent with what Swinburne has been arguing. So Swinburne's been arguing that well science is in the business of subsuming lower level laws into higher level laws and drawing out connections and identifying the laws and Tegmark's saying look how close we are to sort of closing the door on the full numerical physical equations. We're closing in on those and we've got these 32 numerical constants that we find to be true all over the universe but we don't really have an explanation for why they are what they are. Here's uh, some elaboration from Tegmark in the article about uh, what physicists are thinking about the origins of just these uh, 31 or 32 parameters. So in this uh, article, Dimensionless Constants, Cosmology and Other Dark Matters, Tegmark and his co-authors write, so why do we observe these 31 parameters to have the particular values listed in Table 1? Interest in that question has grown with the gradual realization that some of these parameters appear fine-tuned for life in the sense that small relative changes to their values would result in dramatic qualitative changes that could preclude intelligent life and hence the very possibility of reflective observation. As discussed extensively elsewhere, there are four common responses to this realization. Okay, so before I go on, notice there's several connections here to draw out with Swinburne. First off, nobody in physics seems to be listening to Swinburne and saying, okay, well, we can't explain this stuff, so we can't go beyond the, the ceiling here. It looks to be that uh, physics is actively and deliberately engaged in doing just the project that Swinburne says they're not capable of doing. Um, and notice that Tegmark is, his attention is being drawn to this by the fine-tuning arguments. And that's the other uh, variety of teleological argument I was referring to earlier. Okay, so here's the four common responses. Maybe the fact that our universe has just these features and not some others is a fluke. Any apparent fine-tuning is a fluke and best ignored. There's no real answer to it. Or second, there might be a multiverse. These parameters vary across an ensemble of physically realized and for all practical purposes parallel universes and we find ourselves in one where life is possible. That's to say that our universe is one among many where all of the different variations on theme, different sets of physical laws, uh, places where hydrogen does something different than what it does here, places where there's no hydrogen at all, places where the periodic table of elements is utterly different than this one. So all of those universes are out there, they all live, they all exist in parallel to each other. We're, we happen to be in one where there's life, the, presumably there would be others where uh, life is possible, but there would be others where life is not possible. So the multiverse says, the multiverse theory says that all of the variations are out there, every card is in the deck, but only one or some of the cards are aces, for instance. So the ace cards are going to have life in them, but the other cards in the deck may not be hospitable. Third, uh, it may be that the reason our universe has just these parameters is design. Our universe is somehow created or simulated with parameters chosen to allow life. And that, of course, is Swinburne's uh, contention. And fourth, fecundity. And there's a great vocabulary word for the day. Um, and that's to say there's no deliberate fine-tuning going on because intelligent life of some form will emerge under extremely varied circumstances. And fecundity here means fertile or there are lots and lots of circumstances under which life can, can proliferate. So in lots and lots of uh, uh, parts of our universe or maybe across the multiverse, life is all over the place. So the fact that we find ourselves in a universe that's hospitable to life is not that surprising. Um, it's not that surprising to find sand on a beach. That's where sand is. And it wouldn't be that surprising to find life in a universe because life is fecund. Uh, and Tegmark finally says options one two and four tend to be preferred by physicists. 
That is, they overlook um, uh, Swinburne's third option, or they reject the Swinburne's third option. With the recent developments in inflation and high energy theory giving new popularity to option two. And it looks like increasingly more and more physicists are endorsing the view that our universe is one among many um, in the multiverse. That's quite uh, clearly relevant because now that means that if the there is a multiverse and all of these different physical uh, scenarios are achieved, then we would expect to find every single variation on theme and we'd expect to find the nothing universes and that completely undercuts the basic premise of Swinburne's argument um, where he says well why is it that our universe has just these values and not some others well all the others are out there too we're just not pondering any of those we're not in one of those okay another objection and this one's much more abstract if that's possible at least a, l a little bit less uh, involved with the physics of it Swinburne says that it's astronomically unlikely that the matter in the universe would organize into just this set of law lawful regularities uh, it's unlikely it's it's uh, improbable says Swinburne that hydrogen would just fall into those behaviors everywhere in the universe and that means that randomness has got to be rejected or some of their explanations has got to be rejected and that that claim that um, it's astronomically unlikely is what drives the whole argument remember Swinburne says well these things are surprising they're surprising that, that there's something rather than nothing it's surprising that the that the world is lawful and it's, it's got simple laws and so on those are surprising that is to say if you ask Swinburne the question well were it not for God's efforts what would you expect things to do what would you expect the non God state of the world to be and it looks like Swinburne thinks that the default state of matter, this, this the default state of nature, which is sort of a strange oxymoronic way to put it, but the default state of uh, uh, of reality is to either be nothingness or to be chaos. So since it's not that way, Swinburne's surprised. He he's taken aback by the fact that it's not nothing. It's not chaotic. Well, that it's that presumption or it's that. Uh, source of his surprise that we need to take issue with in this particular objection. How can we evaluate the claim that that there being something rather than nothing or that there is a, 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 a physical laws rather than no physical laws, how can we evaluate the claim that that's unlikely? On what ground or what from, from what perspective can we make this assertion natural laws themselves are unlikely, which appears to be what Swinburne's saying. Think of it this way. Probability or likelihoods presuppose order or regularity. We can't make any probability judgments. I can't say, oh, well, tomorrow there's a 70% chance that the temperature is going to be above 90 degrees. Well, I can only do that on the basis of past experience, on the basis of drawing from prior days that had similar conditions, there's similar wind conditions, similar pressure conditions, um, similar times of the year. I can say, well, you know, uh, in 80% of the cases in the past, uh, a, a day in August is over 90 degrees. Well, look, that presumes regularity, that presumes lawfulness. But what Swinburne seems to be asking is, what's the likelihood of lawfulness? And the problem here, the objection, the, the complaint I'm trying to suggest to us is that we're not in a position to evaluate the probability or improbability of matters being orderly or non-orderly by chance. The idea that we can assign a probability to the laws of nature that themselves make things either probable or not is a category mistake. It's as if um, Swinburne saying how probable is probability and that doesn't make any sense likelihood uh, th this notion that the that that the world as we find it is is unlikely is presumes some perspective that we don't have now this objection is not a sort of devastating objection it doesn't undercut Swinburne the way say Darwin undercuts Paley but it raises a really serious question Swinburne's argument springs from a sense of surprise I'm surprised that the world has these features because I didn't expect them to have these features but now we're 
we're undercutting that sense of surprise and saying, from what vantage would you be surprised? What's your data set here? What sort of information? Have you made observations of other universes that do and don't have order? And you've now developed some expectations that, well, on the whole, in the vast majority of cases, universes are disorderly. Look, we're in, our, we're in an orderly one, so that's unlikely. Well, look, you know, um, with, with, uh, with say the lottery, for instance, um, I'd be surprised to scratch off my lottery card and find that I had won uh, t uh, $10 million. Uh, because I can compare to these other cases and I know that most lottery cards are losers. But how is it that Swinburne is in a position to say that order, like we find in our world, is unlikely? Um, so, so the objection here is a complaint about from uh, a complaint about it's a, it's a doubt, a kind of an urging to suspend judgment about that particular um, premise in the argument. Which okay, so let's wrap up the big uh, points here. Modern post-Darwin teleological arguments focus on alleged evidence for order in the laws of nature or in physics itself. Uh, Swinburne's argument is different than Paley's in that regard. So he's trying to give an argument from the order of physics. Uh, these arguments need some grounds on which to contend that order, regularity, or habitability for humans are unlikely on their own. They demand some designer with a plan, and that's the way these, the pattern these arguments have made. And we've seen a couple of objections, and I won't suggest that they can't possibly be answered. Uh, there's a whole other sort of round of responses and rebuttals, objections and replies in the literature. We're just going to stop at this point. Objections have sought, the ones we've considered, have sought to undermine the probability claim that Swinburne's making, or as Tegmark was suggesting, um, we're seeking out alternative natural explanations. The multiverse hypothesis would be a natural or physical explanation for why we find um, this universe among many and why it has the particular uh, laws that it has.